Hey, everybody. So, yeah, like you said, I'm Dustin. Uh, I do a couple things in the Python community. So I work on the Python package index. Uh, I'm the organizer for PyTexas, which, by the way, is May 16th, 17th, 2020 in Austin, Texas. I'm also a developer advocate at Google. I oversee all our Python advocacy for Google Cloud. Uh, and while I have a lot of fun doing all of those things, uh, y'all might not think of that as capital F, U, N, fun, right? Uh, so today I want to talk to you a little bit about how to keep fun in computing. And the origin for this talk was a quote by someone named Alan Perlis. So Alan Perlis was the first recipient of the Turing Award uh, for his influence uh, in the area of advanced programming techniques and compiler construction. So it doesn't sound super fun. But he said this, he said, I think that it's extraordinarily important that we in computer science keep fun in computing. When it started out, it was an awful lot of fun. Eventually, we began to feel as if we were really responsible for the successful, error-free, perfect use of these machines. Who agrees with this? Like, who <laughs> writes code in their day-to-day -day job and they are feel responsible for the code running correctly, right? Yeah, that's kind of what your job is as a programmer. Uh, Alan said, I think that we're responsible for stretching them, setting them off in new directions, and keeping fun in the house. I hope the field of computer science never loses its sense of fun. Um, so I remember like the same was true for me. When I first started computing, like when I wrote my first program, it was super fun. And because there's like no stress, I was just, you know, going to do it. And I actually remember the first program I ever wrote. Uh, it was for this device. <laughs> Who had one of these? Yeah. Who had like two or three of these? Uh, the reason I remember the program that I wrote for my TI-83 Plus uh, was because it was also the first open source program I ever wrote. So this still exists actually. TICalc.org is like an open source repository for programs for TI calculators. And uh, I wrote this program called Matrix Coding. And you might think, well, it's a graphing calculator. It's called Matrix Coding. Probably has something to do with matrix multiplication. No, not that kind of matrix. It was this kind of matrix. <laughs> So I published this in 2003, Matrix came out in 1999, I was still obsessed with it. Uh, the description of my program was, chances are if you are reading this, you've been in search of a good TI program that will duplicate the ever popular matrix coding as seen in the movie. Uh, it came with screenshots, <laughs> so it looked like. It actually, I didn't realize this until I went back and looked at it, it got a review. This is the best matrix program I have seen. It would be better if the numbers move faster, but other than that is a good simulation of the matrix. <laughs> Yes, thank you. And yesterday I actually figured out there are now TI-83 emulators, so this is what it looks like when you run my program. So it's, this is all it does. All right, so this thing is totally useless. No one told me to do this. I just did it for fun. It kind of does look like the Matrix. Uh, and this, I, I remember doing this you know, it was at the very beginning of my entire career as a programmer, and it was so much fun to do. I I ran it all the time on my calculator when I was supposed to be doing geometry. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, just generally about fun and, and our experiences with fun and computing. So we're going to talk about fun and failure, fun and ambition, fun and curiosity, and we'll also talk a little bit about fun and Python. Let's talk about fun and failure. Uh, I want to talk about Simone Yertz. Uh, she's a Swedish inventor. She's a YouTube and robotics enthusiast. And she calls herself the queen of shitty robots. Uh, if you've seen Simone before, she builds, this is a picture of her, this is a popcorn eating device. Those are hands on either side that throw popcorn in her face. She has a really popular YouTube channel, and she's definitely world renowned for her creation of totally useless machines, and has risen to the top of her field because it's a really small field. Uh, <laughs> no one actually cares about shitty robots. Uh, so this is what a day in Simone's life is like. So she wakes up with her alarm clock. <laughs> She eats breakfast. <laughs> she puts on her lipstick. She makes lunch or dinner, maybe. <laughs> this one is terrifying. <laughs> uh, and then she eats her soup. <laughs> so I love these videos. They're all, they're all hilarious. And my favorite part is that she's usually totally deadpan in all of her videos. She doesn't break, but this one is great because she just start, can't help but start laughing. Um, Simone has a TED Talk, so these videos are super popular. Her TED Talk is called Why You Should Make Useless Things. 
It's really interesting. It talks about her sort of history and why she started doing this and what the goal was. And she said, building things with hardware, especially if you're teaching it to yourself, is something that is really difficult to do. So she had this idea. She wanted to learn how to build things with hardware. She didn't have a hardware robotic engineering background or anything like that, but she wanted to learn how to do it. However, she said that it has a high likelihood of failure and moreover, has a high likelihood of making you feel stupid, right? There's a lot of potential for failure when doing hardware. So what she did was, she came up with a setup that would guarantee success. Instead of trying to succeed, I was gonna try to build things that would fail. And because she basically set herself up for failure, she'd succeed every time. Every time she built a robot <laughs> that didn't work, she would succeed. She also said, is this expression of joy and humility that often gets lost in engineering? And I think this is probably true. For Simone, this was a way for her to avoid this like performance anxiety about creating hardware and sort of bootstrapping the process of getting good at it. Um, Simone was definitely extremely successful in making bad robots. She has a lot of subscribers on YouTube. And she gets interviewed all the time. Uh, she has her TED talk. She gave this talk uh, for the Long Now Foundation. And in this talk, she said something that her main priority is this, and what she strives to have everyone else do, is to welcome and accept failure. So when we play, when we build things that are useless, we accept failure, right? There's, there's nothing holding us back. But when we're not playing, when we're building things for production, uh, accepting failure stifles us, right? We can't let things fail in that case. So coincidentally, uh, has anyone ever heard of the Long Now Foundation? Yeah, oh wow, a lot of people, cool. So she was interviewed for this uh, 50th anniversary thing they did. The Long Now Foundation is an example of fun and ambition. That's the next thing I wanna talk about. So this guy, Danny Hillis, he is the inventor of something called the clock of the long now. Um, Danny spent his life building supercomputers, uh, many of which are probably in museums more than there are actually ones running these days. And Danny noticed something as we approached the new millennium, the year 2000. So basically what he noticed was as we got closer and closer to January 1st, 2020, 2020 I've been saying that a lot because of the <laughs> Python end of life, 2000, uh, he noticed that people were you know, focusing less and less on in the future. They were thinking about that specific date as it got closer and closer and not thinking about the next 100 years, the next 1,000 years. And he wanted to change that. He thought that was really like short, short, narrow focus and, and short-minded. So what he wanted to do was he wanted to build a clock. This clock would tick once a year. The century hand would advance every 100 years and the cuckoo would come out on the millennium. And then he said, he wanted this clock to the cuckoo to come out every year for the next 10,000 years. So 10,000 years here is like just within the limits of plausibility, right? We have found artifacts that are approximately 10,000 years old and they weren't like explicitly cared for or maintained, but they still continue to exist. So like maybe we could actually build something that lasts for 10,000 years. So this is, uh, this is the clock that was first built uh, it was finished January 31st, 1999. So it was finished in time to ring in the new year. And it's called the Clock of the Long Now. And it's a little bit smaller than that. It's about six feet high or so. However, this is actually just a scale prototype of the clock. This is the clock that they're currently building. Notice the huge gears that people are standing on top of. Uh, this is the pendulum for the clock. It weighs a lot and it's the size of multiple people. And this clock is sunk into a massive mine shaft in the ground that's huge uh, in this mountain in West Texas. Actually, no, sorry, in a mountain in Texas. And that's not actually even the real clock. The real clock is going to be built in this mountain in Nevada, uh, and it's going to be huge. And when you're building things like this, the, the biggest concerns that you have are things like earthquakes and like the changing rotational speed of the Earth, right? These are like huge geologic planetary concerns. And so uh, this is really interesting. It's an incredibly ambitious project, right? Like it's very, very likely that this is going to fail. Uh, so when they created the clock of the long now, they found some design principles. And these are really interesting things that they sort of just come out of the process of designing a clock that's going to last 10,000 years. So there are things like longevity, maintainability, transparency, evolvability, scalability. Because it turns out like designing a clock to last 10,000 years is generally a good way to design anything to last a long time. Like these are things that we could talk about with open source software or for your projects at work. 
And actually, there's a really interesting thing about the clock. They not in the process of creating it, they also created like a new way to power things as well. So the clock needs to exist, even if humans don't continue to exist. So if there's no one there to wind the clock, it doesn't run on nuclear power. It doesn't run on solar. It runs on the changes in temperature between day and night on the mountaintop above where the clock is. So it actually uses like just changing temperature to power itself. This is something that's didn't exist before, or we didn't have a need for this before, but now they, we could build this. And this is the general goal. Such a clock, if sufficiently impressive and well-engineered, would embody deep time for all people. Right? Danny would just wanted something to embody time for everyone else. Uh, it would do what time, do for time what photographs of Earth from space have done for thinking about the environment. Such icons would reframe the way people think. Right? This is an ambitious project. It has a high likelihood of failure, but it's really fun, and it produces kind of new and interesting thoughts and technology as well, and can change how we think. All right, let's talk about a different kind of clock. Let's talk about fun and whimsy. So here's a clock that someone made. It's called the egg timer. You input the date of your first period, the age when your mother, when she first entered menopause, and you click a button said, that says, submit for a sense of urgency. And then... <laughs> The clock starts ticking. So this was created for something called the stupid shit no one needs and terrible ideas hackathon. <laughs> created by Sam Levine and Amber Wigner Bearskin. Uh, I'll call this just the stupid hackathon. And this is a totally fun and whimsical hackathon where people build things that are completely useless. So for example, uh, here's something called infinite folders. You run a script. And it creates infinite folders and directories on your hard drive. Never ending. This one's called Eyeball Pong. You play Pong by moving your eyeballs. This one's called Hypochondriap. You type in your symptoms and it diagnoses you with the worst possible disease. This is Soylent for Women. Uh, going by the adage, pink it, shrink it, double the price doesn't actually exist, it's just an ad. Uh, this one's fun, it, uh, this is a tool called uh, Outcognito Mode. It's a browser extension that publicly tweets everything that you type and every website that you visit. Uh, sometimes they're not just software, they're physical objects as well. So this one is a one called Wine Chimes. It's wind chimes, but they're hot dogs. <laughs> This is the opposite of ad block. It's called non-ad block. It blocks everything but the ads. <laughs> and this one's my favorite. Uh, it's a 3D cheese printer. <laughs> so I took a 3D printer and it prints cheese whiz instead. All right. <laughs> Why did they do this? All right, this is a stupid hackathon. The creator said, we get invited to a lot of stupid hackathons and decided we wanted to start our own. <laughs> Um, so many hackathons are about solving problems that exist in social, political, or economic sphere, problems that can't and probably shouldn't be solved within the sphere of technology. So their hackathon ideally acts as a critique of the tech industry as a whole, but is also a fun space to make things that aren't constrained by solutionism. And I should warn you, if you're going to Google the stupid hackathon, a lot of the things that people don't need are also really obscene as well, so just not, you know, keep that in mind. Um, but this is a really fun project where people are legitimately creating interesting projects and software tools that are totally useless and have no point and are hilarious, as you can see, and really fun. Next section, fun and curiosity. So part of the ability to create fun and whimsical or ambitious projects is just generally being curious about it as well. So I want to highlight uh, sort of three really well-known famous computer scientists that are not computer scientists, just people in the industry that uh, really embraced their sense of curiosity and attributed their success to curiosity itself. So the first is Claude Shannon. Um, Claude Shannon is known as the father of information theory. He was a mathematician, electrical engineer, and cryptographer. He worked for Bell Labs, which was, and I'm biased, but kind of like the Google of the 1950s. And uh, he was famous for doing code breaking during World War II. He, he did a bunch of really amazing stuff. Um, he wrote a paper in 1950 called Program a Computer for Playing Chess. This is the first paper ever written about the possibility that computers could ever play chess. Uh, he was well ahead of his time. We weren't really thinking about this at all right now. And it was generally for Claude, this was play. He wasn't actually interested in building a system that could solve 
all the problems that are necessary to make computers play chess, he was just curious. And he wanted to see if it was actually possible that someday computers might be able to play chess. And what would it take? Uh, so he wrote this paper. It was in the, I think it was published in 1950, written in 1949. And then he actually like went and built it. So this is a, a chess playing computer that uh, Claude Shannon had built. Uh, it would like light up the next move that the computer wanted to make. Uh, it could only play the last six moves of a, a chess match, so it was really you know limited uh, in what it could do. But it worked, and for him, this was play. Like Bell Labs was not paying him to do this, um, and as a result of him thinking about this, he sort of set off this whole uh, maybe not industry, but like idea of the fact that computers could play chess. And we worked on it and worked on it. And it wasn't actually until 1966, it was almost 50 years after he wrote his original paper, that we actually created a computer. This is Deep Blue versus Gary Kasparov, where a computer actually beat a you know, chess player, a professional chess player in chess. And it was amazing. And for Glad, like this, again, this is play. His goal was never to create Deep Blue. He just wanted to play around. And he was curious what computers could do. Um, another example of what Claude did, he, he built this thing called Theseus. So it was a mouse that could find its way out of a maze. He was just interested if a computer could uh, learn and remember and find its way out of a maze. And uh, I'll let, let's see if this works, I'll let uh, Claude explain Theseus. So this is really incredible, and again, for Claude, this is playing, right? He was just uh, trying to play. So Claude played so much that they actually named a book after him. Uh, when they wrote his autobiography, it was called A Mind at Play. And uh, he said that, I think the history of science has shown that valuable consequences often proliferate from simple curiosity. So for him, a lot of his success, he attributed to curiosity, and the things that he built that became successful were also just sort of based on him playing around. Another person really uh, found his curiosity to be influential was Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple Computers. He said that much of what I stumbled into by following my curiosity and intuition turned out to be priceless later on. Uh, so there's kind of this apocryphal story of Steve Jobs. So he, um, he was going to a birthday party for a young boy uh, in New York, and he brought one of the very first Mac computers with him. And when he got to the party, he was, you know, he set it up and he was showing the boy how to use it. He was showing the boy how to use this drawing program that came with it. Uh, but this was a big party in New York. There were a lot of famous people there. So there were these two artists walk in, Andy Warhol, Keith Haring. These are huge, big name artists at the time. And they saw this computer and they're like, what is this? And they got really interested in it. And Steve Jobs left. He like wasn't interested in showing these two incredibly famous and successful artists how to use this machine that maybe could be used to produce new art. And afterwards, the host of the party asked Steve, like, well, why were you so interested in teaching the boy how to use the computer and you were, weren't interested in teaching Andy Warhol how to use it? And what Steve said was, older people sit down and ask, what is it? But the boy asked, what can I do with it? He sort of saw this difference in curiosity between adults and children. Children want to know what they can do. Adults want to know just what is it. Like, I don't understand it. And for him, uh, th embracing this childlike curiosity was sort of something that helped him continue and find new and interesting things in his career. Last person I wanted to highlight, uh, this guy. I don't know if you can see a picture. It's, that guy looks fun already. Uh, as you know, Albert Einstein was a famous Swiss patent clerk. <laughs> and uh, he said this, which I just love this quote. He said, I have no special talent. I am only passionately curious. That's it. All right, so since this is a Python conference, I also wanted to show you some things
that are fun in Python. And of course, Python is fun because like, we named the language after <laughs> this, Monty Python. Uh, so the first example I have is our PEPs. So we have PEPs, they're Python enhancement proposals. It's how we change the language, how we change the governance of the language. Uh, some of you might have heard of before, PEP8, style guide for Python code. Um, PEP20, Zen of Python. There's PEP569, this is the Python 3.8 release schedule. It sort of shows you like at which point uh, different alpha, beta releases of the Python, the new version of Python is going to be released. There's also PEP404, has anyone ever <laughs> heard of PEP404? Yeah, this is the Python 2.8 unreleased schedule. <laughs> Uh, it's really fun. It's uh, an informational PEP and written by Barry Warsaw. And it says, uh, this document describes the undevelopment and unreleased schedule for Python 2.8. Uh, the unreleased manager is Cardinal Biggles. That's another Monty Python reference. Uh, the unreleased schedule is 2.8 final, never. <laughs> um, the official pronouncement is rule number six. There is no official Python 2.8 release. There never will be. It is an X release. It is the end of Python 2 line of development. And this is definitely true. Upgrade path go to Python 3. And of course, that's another Python, Monty Python reference. This is an X parrot. Um, another Python uh, fun and interesting thing. So in Python 2, if you divided 1 by 2, you got 0. That's kind of weird. Um, so we changed that, Python 3. Uh, there's this fun, this uh, kind of this like helpful module that comes with Python, that do double underscore future. So in Python 2, if you want the behavior that's eventually going to exist in Python 3, you could from double underscore future import division. And then afterwards, when you divide 1 by 2, you get 0 0.5, which is what most people would expect to happen here. Um, so this, this module is kind of fun too. So at one point, like maybe there was some discussion about whether Python would have braces. Like a lot of languages like Java, JavaScript, have braces instead of colons and, and, and indentation-specific uh, um, code blocks and things like that. Uh, so, like, maybe Python could someday look like that, uh, but that definitely wasn't going to happen. Oh, you could do fun things with braces like this, like inline based on your parentheses. So, if you ever try to import braces from future, you get a fun syntax error. Error. <laughs> Not a chance. It's never going to happen. Okay, the last one I have. So, like I said, I work on PyPI, and, uh, oops, jumped all the way to the end. Oh, man. Hang on, guys. Uh, so, like I said, I work on PyPI. Why doesn't that work? Yeah, I don't know. Oh, there it is. All right, like I said, I work on PyPI. Um, I don't. I don't. No one's ever like come out and told me this, so don't ruin the surprise for anyone else. But if you're on PyPI and and you like. Just type in like a bad URL that doesn't exist. You, as you would expect, you get a 404 page. But what most people don't do when they go to a 404 page is scroll downwards. <laughs> Again, another Monty Python reference. So if you do this. Now my good man, some cheese peas. Yes, certainly, sir. What would you like? Well, uh, how about a little red Lister? I'm afraid. All right, so the joke here is that PyPI used to be called the cheese shop. It's a Monty Python reference. Cheese shop doesn't have any cheese. And so uh, now we get this sketch. All right, so let's see if I can restart my presentation. All right, so fun things in Python. All right, so let's talk about fun in you. Because the goal of this is really to give you all the ability and understanding of how to just maintain a sense of fun in computing. Uh, so I hope that you got some of these things out of the talk. First. Let yourself fail. Set yourself up for failure. Build something that you know is going to fail, right? You don't get an opportunity to do that very often, especially in your job or day job. So just let it happen. Build something totally useless. So remember Simone's robots. Like They don't actually have a purpose, but they have this side benefit of teaching you something or giving you a new perspective on something. Second, build something totally ambitious. And this is kind of like setting yourself up for failure, too. But build something that's like you don't think could possibly ever succeed. Something that is so insane. And just, you know, give it a shot. Try it. Maintain your sense of childlike curiosity. Remember Einstein and Jobs and Claude Shannon. Think back when you were a child, when you first saw programming, 
maybe last week when you first saw programming. Think about how much fun it was when you were just curious about what you could do with the language and not what it was. Uh, and finally, keep writing Python, because Python is super fun. All right, thanks, everybody. <laughs>